Good morning, everyone. Thanks for rolling in and uh, adapting to all of your room changes and all the rest. As you can see today, we're continuing on in graphing. We'll be there until the end of this week. And right now we're moving forward from, if you remember last week, we looked at polynomial functions. We spent a lesson on absolute value functions as well. And we're gonna have a look at exponential and logarithmic functions. Now, I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but there's kind of no more relevant time than I can think of than now to understand functions like this. They're very, very relevant to the situations we've been going through over the last few months. Um, exponential and logarithmic functions are all about functions that, that change in proportion to their size change in proportion to their size, or maybe change in proportion to their value is a better way to say it. So here are a couple of examples of an exponential and a logarithmic graph. Let's just briefly look at them, right? This is a human population growth chart um, over centuries, as you can see if you look closely at the horizontal axis there. And it makes sense that you would have faster population growth when you have a larger population to grow from. And that's why you can see that number there um, or that value of the function um, skyrocketing over there on the right hand side of the graph, right? So this is an exponential graph. We're pretty used to seeing things like that. Um, this is a logarithmic curve or could be modeled with a logarithmic curve over here on the right. Um, whereas an exponential graph grows faster the bigger it is. Uh, what characterizes a logarithmic graph or a logarithmic function is that it grows slower the bigger it is. Now this of course is the situation we've been all monitoring over the last few um, weeks and months and the issue here is that well why would these curves slow down? It's actually not to do with the virus itself because that would be exponential growth. It's really because on the scale of countries, right? The bigger the uh, state of the emergency is, the more drastically we act. And so, you know, as the number of cases and deaths goes up, governments around the world start to act more dramatically, and that's the whole flattening the curve business, right? So you can see, as the numbers have increased, things have slowed down, which is what you would hope would happen if there was an appropriate response, and that's the characteristic shape of a logarithmic curve. Um, the larger the value is, the slower that it grows. Now it's worth mentioning that these are both kind of human situations, but we find exponential and logarithmic uh, scenarios all around the world in the natural world as well. So here's just a quick example for you, and I promise I will not turn this into a chemistry or physics lesson, um, but there's not just exponential growth, there's also exponential decay. And people will be pretty familiar, I hope, with what you're looking at on the screen. This is how carbon-14 dating works, right? Carbon-14, as I think we're all familiar with from like Year 10 chemistry, it's an unstable isotope, so over time it decays into nitrogen 14. And here's the thing, right? As the quantity of carbon 14 reduces, well, the amount of rate of change also reduces because you've got less carbon 14 to decay. So the rate of change is again proportional to the size of whatever you're dealing with here. And in, instead of, you know, um, a population size, in this case it's a number of atoms that are, you know, giving off radiation. So, all of that just to say, we see exponentials and logarithmics all around us. They're a crucial piece of knowledge and skill to master in understanding the world. So, as promised, we're looking at graphing, right? Now, with exponential and logarithmic graphs, uh, mercifully, they're actually quite simple to draw, which is nice. You saw some examples up above. Um, but there are really four key features that we're looking for and that you should be uh, trying to aim for in terms of making sure you have a good exponential graph or a logarithmic graph. We're going to draw um, these graphs and then we're gonna highlight the four features, okay? So let's go ahead, we'll start with the exponential and what I'd all, love us all to draw is, uh, let's go with black here, let's all draw y equals two to the power of x. So we're familiar of course with x when you see it up there in the index, that's the giveaway that you've got an exponential curve of some kind, as opposed to, you know, you don't have to write this down, but as opposed to a polynomial where the x is in the base, okay? So when you've got a, whoops, that's too big, when you've got um, a curve like this, you could just put in some values, right? You could say, well, what happens when x equals zero? That's an important value. I'll get two to the power of zero, which is one. What happens when x equals one? I'll get two to the power of one, it's two. And it goes and it skyrockets, right? So we get this familiar kind of shape that we've seen in those other graphs that we were having a look at before. And you wanna do it in one smooth motion so that you have a good curve there. If you're not graphing in pencil, please do because if you screw it up, which is fairly common, then you can fix it up fairly easily, okay? 
Now you can see on the screen the first feature that we're looking for here, right? Um, the first feature that really matters is shape. So this familiar exponential graph, the important thing is number one, it's one smooth curve and it gets steeper and steeper forever. Um, as you progress from left to right, as your x values increase, uh, you get this steeper and steeper gradient. So you've got to make sure that it doesn't, you know, uh, topple over, um, you know, and sort of decrease. You don't want it to become vertical and then like back over on itself. That's a bad idea. Um, so you want to get that familiar exponential shape happening. Okay. There's the first thing we're looking for. The second thing is actually something that I signposted earlier. Um, the, you can guess because it starts with an I. It's this one and only intercept that this particular graph has. Now this is a y-intercept, so we let x equal zero, which is what we did earlier. And what you'll find is, of course, your y-intercept is one. So that's the second feature. You're always going to have an intercept somewhere. Um, in this case, we don't actually have an x-intercept, and the reason for that is because of the third feature. Starts with an A, uh, maybe you're shouting it out to your teachers right now. It is of course the asymptote. Now it's really crucial, um, especially now that we're paying close attention to the graph, um, that we actually mark in where the asymptote is. Uh, this is an exponential graph, so it has a horizontal asymptote, and um, you need to, number one, draw the asymptote in, and number two, actually tell us what the equation of the asymptote is. So you can see it there, nestled along the x-axis there, that's why I'm actually not touching there. If you are trying to draw your uh, graph and your Cartesian plane um, with the same color, like you don't have red and black like I do, um, then make sure that your asymptote is, is clearly visible, either in thick lines or just slightly off of the axis so that we can see it. If you put it over the top and they're the same color and I can't see your asymptote, then it might as well not be there. So make sure it's very obvious. And like I said before, let's go ahead and uh, write down its equation, y equals zero, okay? So shape, intercept, asymptote, most people are pretty good at nailing down these three features. But there's one last feature that I wonder if you can think back to when we're having a look at absolute value, when we look at polynomials. Every graph actually needs these if they're relevant. Um, at the moment, this exponential graph that we're looking at, it might not be y equals 2 to the x. Um, in its present form, it could be y equals 3 to the x, or 8 to the x, or 100 to the x. What I need is an additional piece of information to sort of make sure it's unambiguous that I know where this is. Um, and maybe you're guessing now because you can see it starts with a p. What we need is a point for scale, um, or a locking point as some people like to call it. Now a point for scale, um, this can go anywhere on the graph so long as it's at a convenient spot. I like to choose um, an x value that isn't hard to evaluate. Um, I've already done x equals zero because that's the y-intercept. I'm gonna go with x equals one. Now when I go ahead and um, let's put it up here in the top right hand corner to work it out, I'm gonna write PFS so that I can show what my working is. Um, I'm gonna try x equals one, which means y equals two to the power of one, okay? So therefore, it's just equal to two. So now I have a set of coordinates, right? Um, the coordinates are going to be one, comma two. Now this is an important spot, right, to pause. You can't just, now that you know where it is, you can't just put this thing anywhere because the whole point is that this thing, see what I did there, whole point, um, is that this has to be for scale, right? So therefore, I can't just like say, oh, I'm gonna make that my point for scale. It has to be in a specific spot that matches the rest of the scale that I've put here. Now let's not put that point on. My Y coordinate here is two, right? Now I already have a vertical scale in action because I've got this Y equals one spot here. So if I'm saying this is one, then two had better be twice as high above the x-axis, otherwise I won't be to scale. Like if I put the two value up here, then my whole graph is shot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna position it carefully. Um, I'll zoom in even if you've got a ruler or maybe you've got a grid that makes this easier. If, uh, if I've got my one here, then two looks like it's gonna be about there. Do you agree with that spot? That's twice as high, right? So therefore, let's go ahead Let's mark that in. So when I go across to the right and see where I collide with the graph, this is going to be my point for scale now. It's one comma two, and you can see it matches up with where my two is, okay? And you're done. Those are the four features that we're looking for, shape, intercept, asymptote, and a point for scale. Now, even though we're not going to look at logarithmic graphs in more detail until the second half of the lesson, um, it makes sense to actually really quickly have a look at them now, because the four features that we just looked at, shape, intercept, asymptote, and point for scale, they're the same four features that are relevant to this graph, because exponential graphs 
logarithmic graphs, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna draw this logarithmic graph. Remember, this is the overall shape we're kind of going at here, right? Instead of getting steeper and steeper forever, we're gonna get shallower and shallower forever, if that makes sense, okay? So let's go ahead and again, we'll try and draw it in one smooth curve. Let's give it a go. Whoops, sorry guys. Okay. So there's my curve. You can see it's kind of uh, going to very closely match the same kind of shape you saw over there on the exponential. So shape ticked off. Um, I've got an intercept. Now because the logarithmic curve is the opposite of the exponential curve, inverse is actually the technical term, then where we had a y-intercept of one, in this case you can see I'm going to have an x-intercept of one. So you go ahead, mark that in. Um, third thing is the asymptote. Now, I previously had an, uh, a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. So now you can see I'm going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals zero. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mark that in. Dotted lines. And don't forget the equation there. Uh, shape check, intercept check, asymptote. Lastly, my point for scale. Um, I should have mentioned, by the way, I haven't told you what the equation of this logarithmic graph is. Let's make it the exact opposite, the ex exact inverse of the previous exponential we did. Let's do log base two of x. Um, and the reason why I do that is purely because I'm lazy, because I can use that point for scale that I worked out before. If the previous point for scale was one comma two, then here, this graph is gonna go through the, uh, the switch around of the x's and the y's. It's gonna go through two comma one. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing and I'm gonna look at this horizontal scale here. Um, if I position this as one, then if I'm gonna go over to x equals two, it's gonna to have to be rough, roughly double along, otherwise my scale will be inaccurate. Okay, so that's the spot I'm looking for. Let's mark that in as two. I go up to the curve and then here is my coordinates and I'm gonna label it as such, okay, two comma one. 